Professor Brian Wilson, and uh, today he's going to give us a seminar with a kind of uh, overview about the research going on in his uh, laboratory and uh, many other things. I hope we be learning with this one hour seminar. And uh, just to remind you that uh, today we keep going with the short course at 4 o'clock. Our first 
Brazilian street. We have a post up in our lab. You know, just as some of the graduate students are, are uh, uh, NDs, uh, so there's a, uh, a gastroenterologist here, and there's a, uh, a dental surgeon uh, who's also a PhD student in the lab. Okay. Oh, we have some people in the laboratory uh, who have actual space in the laboratory to work in the laboratory, who are actually from other institutions. Uh, University of Western Ontario and is about 100 miles and Ryerson University is the second university in Toronto. So there are people from other universities actually doing their research work in our labs. So the, the three research themes of our labs are optical therapeutics, diagnostics, and then devices and biotechnology. Since we're in a hospital, it's very strongly driven by clinical uh, uh, interests. So I just want to go through each of these and show you. So this is, that's a collage of uh, optical therapeutics. Uh, the whole lab started with photodynamic therapy, and that's probably about one third of our work now, uh, with the other work being in other therapeutics or, or in uh, diagnostics and analytics. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of this. So the photodynamic therapy, uh, both in patients and in animals, instrument development. Uh, I'll show you some work on fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, and uh, we do some work on low level light therapy, although this is mainly with industry. So it's mainly doing uh, projects with companies where we don't have a core academic program in low light therapy. <coughs> now, uh, Professor Magneto asked me to, to sort of be complete in the listing of all our research projects so that we could look for possible interactions. So I'm going to show you these lists. Now, lists are very boring uh, for you to read. Uh, so I'm just going to show these lists and very quickly uh, uh, say one or two words about each of these, and then I'll just show some specific examples so that it's not too boring. So in the area of photodynamic therapy, we have instrument development, both light sources and dosimetry. Clinical trials on prostate cancer, clinical trial on brain cancer, just starting clinical trials on metastatic cancer to bone, uh, so cancer in the spinal uh, 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 bone in the spine. Uh, program starting on TDD for infection, collaboration with people at University College and uh, University of California Davis on TDD for epilepsy. And we were a pro project on macular degeneration, and this, in fact, is a kind of white program. So you notice I put here collaborators, uh, and I, I'm going to point this out on each slide because one of the uh, points of our lab is that you'll see that there's a very large number of projects, and even for the number of people I listed, you'll see you cannot do all that work. <laughs> uh, don't, that's ridiculous. Uh, the reason that we're able to do so much is because we have a very large number of collaborators. Uh, I haven't added up, but probably more than 20 different institutions uh, have direct collaborations with us. Um, and that's partly because we like to collaborate, because then we go to nice places and uh, meet other people and have good food. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so I'm going to talk, I'm just going to show you about the prostate cancer. Uh, but just to, to finish this list of therapeutics, a project of femtosecond laser surgery, mainly applied to dentistry. I'll show you the fluorescence image guide surgery. We have some work on thermal therapy, although this is not a great program there. So on PDT, uh, I showed you this slide. Uh, this is the PDT for prostate cancer, where we're putting optical fibers into the prostate. Uh, using a, a system originally developed for brachytherapy for radiation treatment of the prostate. And we've developed uh, dosimetry devices uh, to monitor what's happening inside the prostate. I talked about this at the course just a minute. Uh, this is a collaboration with the Weizmann Institute in Israel, uh, who developed this drug. It's a, 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 a palladium substituted bacterial fuel if you want to demonstrate. Uh, the characteristics are it has a 
extremely long wavelength of activation, way out at 760 nanometers, uh, and it's extremely fast clearing. You get this drug and it's disappeared within half an hour. So the treatment is completely fast clearing. <coughs> Quality, quality, that drug is in blood vessels. Uh, Instead with Denver, we did a whole series of studies in, in dogs uh, uh, at, at, at surgery. Uh, this shows examples. Uh, this is uh, MRI scans uh, of the dog prostate where one optical fiber was put here, another here, and you see this large area of damage caused. And you do the histopathology, you see that with this drug, because it has such a long wavelength, uh, we were able to do quite large lesions, uh, even with single fiber. Uh, and we did a series of uh, response curves, so this is the size of those lesions versus the light dose uh, and versus the drug dose. And you'll notice that you can get up to three or four centimeter diameter lesions with the, with the, from a single fiber, which is much larger than with most other synthesizers. So it's a very interesting drug. It's a big problem that it clears so fast because we have very little time to get the light in. Uh, and, and so we, we actually, as I said yesterday, we, we start the drug and then while we're still putting the drug in, we start the light. But otherwise, if we wait till the end, we don't have enough time. The drug is already clear. So it's a strange balance in the problem with the Very unusual way to do and it means that there is zero tolerance for mistake. So where the drug goes? Everywhere in the vasculature and then it's cleared through the liver. Through the liver. Yeah. That it goes out the blood the blood concentration goes down in thirty minutes. So for liver it may be Oh it probably hangs around in the liver for a long time. Uh, that, that, uh, uh, and we've done studies to show that this minimally damaged to normal tissue. This just shows up the instrumentation. We do treatment planning in order to optimize where we're going to treat the fibers and how much. Uh, uh, I thought I'd just show one specific example. So the prostate is not a cylinder or a series of cylinders. It's quite a complex shape. And so if you use optical fibers like this, you then say, well, how are you going to deliver <coughs> these so that you can treat, say, the apex here, which is very narrow, but also treat the face? And that's actually difficult. So one of the things that has happened is that we have a collaboration with a uh, small company uh, uh, to apply an idea from telecom, from optical fiber telecom. So in telecom, uh, a very common technique is to write gratings into optical fibers. And in telecom, the reason to do this is that these gratings uh, are act as interference filters to select the wavelength. So it's for wavelength multiplexing. Uh, so what you do is you take an optical fiber that has a material uh, that can be changed when it's exposed to UV. And you put a pattern of UV light onto the fiber this just shows the setup, and you can write these gradients. So for telecom, this acts as a filter. For us, it acts as a light scatter. So these uh, gradients scatter the light sideways. And the interesting thing is, it does not have to be uniform. You can write any pattern, so you can make the output any shape you like. And that, uh, so we did a study in which we said, okay, let's say we put a single fiber through the urethra and we want to treat uh, all of this tissue, but of course we need a different amount of light from here to reach the large diameter compared to here. And so we did MRI scans on a patient, reverse calculated how much light would have to come from here, 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 here to get along the boundary, made a fiber with that output, and then tested it. So you can actually make a fiber that is tailored uh, to the shape of the treatment point. Uh, just a word to you about infection. There are projects on periodontal uh, uh, nares, uh, uh, Sterilization. The nares is inside your nose, and uh, it turns out that a major source of infection in 
hospital in patients with self-infection from doing that. So you have a, an operation, so you have a, a, a surgical procedure, and you do this, and you infect yourself. Very common source of infection in hospitals. And so the idea is to do PET inside the patient's nose to sterilize inside the nose. So that's a, 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 pro, a project that we're doing together with a couple of companies. The other thing we've been doing is a spin-off from our own cancer work is osteomyelitis. I'll show you this example. So osteomyelitis is an infection in the bone. It occurs in children, it occurs in, in adults. And so we wanted to see, could you treat infection in bone? And so we set up this model, which was stat aureus, uh, which was transferred with luciferase, and I'll show you how that's done in a moment, to make it bioluminescent. Then we grow the bugs on a wire, on a piece of wire, and then we implant the wire into the bone of these mice. And then when you give bioluciferin, you can actually see the bioluminescence from the infection in the bone. So then we ask, can you treat this with PDT? And so this is an example, this is before treatment, and this animal was treated uh, just on one side. Uh, so here, this side was not treated. Here, after treatment, you see the bioluminescence mm -hmm. bacteria way down. And this animal originally had two implants. Both sides were treated, and you see you're able to do yeah. the bugs. So now we're thinking, how can we take that to patients? Uh, uh, and it should not be too difficult, actually. <laughs> because we've shown from the the dog work in, oste in osteosarcoma that you can deliver light adequately inside the bone. People think of bone as very opaque to light, and it's not true. It's actually more transmitting than many soft tissues. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, there are very, very few reports in the literature on PDT in bone. Uh, Macular degeneration, <coughs> we talked about in the course as, as neovasculature in the eye. Uh, I just wanted to show one project in that we would like to reduce the collateral damage, the damage to the normal tissue, and so that's been done by two photon PDT. So the idea is to do two photon PDT where the photochemistry is produced not by activation with visible light, but activation by a short pulse, 10 per second pulse of infrared light. Uh, so in this case, the probability of absorption goes as the square of the intensity. It's a two photon uh, process. If it's three photons, it goes as a cube, etc. And that means if you have a focus beam, then in the case of one photon, at all of this region, the probability is proportional to the intensity, but here is proportional to the intensity squared, so you only get the damage happening right at the focus. This is the same as a 2 one possible one microscope. And so there is now a project uh, going on, this is a Canada-wide project, uh, uh, which involves developing photosensitizers, so a lot of work with the chemists, to make photosensitizers that have a very high absorption for two photons, and that's not the same as if you take photofred and it's very low to photon absorption, it's, it's no good. So you have to design sensitizers, you do work in cells, work in animal models, and then ultimately the idea is to do this in patients, and this will be done by using a laser scanning beam, so a femtosecond laser scanning in a confocal ophthalmoscope. So you take the pictures of the retina, identify the, the ophthalmologist will then say, okay, I'll treat this region. You'll read that into the computer, and then the laser will, the treatment laser will scan, as so you're like changing by numbers. So when you're talking about femtosecond laser, yeah. I suppose it's, uh, what is the energy of the bird pulse? Uh, it's about 100 femtoseconds. Uh, and uh, in, 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 in length. The energy per pulse, we're not sure at this stage because um, it depends on this guy. Uh, for instance, we did, we've done some studies in cells with photofred, and uh, if we 
do one photon PPT with photoprint in vascular endothelial cells, uh, let's say it takes um, one joule per square centimeter to <coughs> to a certain level. When we use two photon with photoprint, it takes a thousand joules uh, because the cross section is so small. So that and so it would be completely impossible to do the treatment. It would take you weeks. Uh, and so the question is the requirements on the laser are going to depend very much on how good we can make the sense of it. And one idea actually is to use nanoparticles here uh, instead of drug. Uh, to show you fluorescence image guided surgery. Uh, so you know all about fluorescence. So the idea here, we started this with brain tumors. And um, the problem with brain tumors is that if you do the surgery, uh, there is 100% probability that the tumor will come back at the same location because the surgeon cannot remove all the tumor. So a number of years ago, one of our graduate students built a camera, which was a fluorescence camera, a uh, little unusual in that it had light came in and actually came out of the camera and then the fluorescence was detected. So this is a so-called point and shoot camera, turned out to be crazy thing to do from an optical design point of view. It's a nice idea, but it was very difficult to make this work. Um, but anyway, it, it, it was made to work. And this is an example. This is looking down inside the brain in a patient after the surgeon had completely done his surgery. And then you look in fluorescence and you see, oh, there's still tumor that's been and I'll show you a video of that. So we've now changed the technology, and this is now the technology. Much more compact, uh, less capability, but probably good enough. Uh, I want to show you a video of an animal study uh, that we did in a rabbit. So this is a rabbit. Bioluminescence. So this is in the same study of where the tumor cells are made bioluminescent. You 
see the spillage of the dose tumor. And so now you have to follow this up with photodynamic therapy. Uh, optical diagnostics, second, second area. Uh, so we have a fairly big program in optical computer tomography, fluorescence endoscopy, Raman spectroscopy, uh, project on breast illumination I've talked about. And in the last year or so, we've just started some work on nanotechnology using quantum dust. Again, just a list, so we have fluorescence endoscopy, started with GI for colon esophagus. We've just started a study for breast cancer and ductoscopy where the endoscope is put in through the nipple uh, in order to look for cancer inside you uh, in the breast. Uh, Doppler OCT uh, applications both in cancer and cardiovascular disease. Wow. Raman, glucose detection. We've had two projects on glucose detection, optical glucose detection. One of those is still going on, and then we have the breast. So let me just take this example of breast cancer risk assessment. So this is an example where uh, we're using optical diagnostics not to detect cancer, but to take normal women and measure their risk of getting breast cancer the relative risk of getting breast cancer. So that seems crazy, okay? Uh, so let me try to explain it. Uh, about uh, eight, 17 years ago now, there was a paper published in Actor Radiologica, which is a radiological journal, in which this group had taken optical transmission spectra through the breast. So you white light going in, and you measure the spectrum of transmission. Same as here. This is our center. And then they got the spectra and they took 800 women and found that they were able, just by looking at differences in the spectra, to find a number of women in whom the spectra were different uh, from the average uh, who were considered on mammography to be normal, but who subsequently developed breast cancer. Quite a surprising observation, never yeah, followed up, be. because it doesn't make any sense. You see, how could some global change in the breast make a difference? The woman doesn't have breast cancer, so what are you measuring? So that's, that, I always thought that was very interesting, but it's too crazy to follow up. And then at our institution, uh, an epidemiologist called uh, Norman Boyd, over during the 90s, uh, did a big study in which he showed that if you take x-ray mammograms and you digitize them and you measure the density of the breast, then women, age-matched women who have high density breast are six times more likely to develop breast cancer than women with low density. So we made a connection between these, so it's not beautiful, and the idea was could we use optical to get the same assessment of risk as had been done with x-rays. So we did a study, we built a system, light goes in, we detect, we measure this over four quadrants, we do the spectrum, chemometric analysis, and we've shown recently and published that this optical technique is at least as sensitive as the x-ray. Again, we're not detecting breast cancer. We're simply saying this woman is low risk, this woman is high risk, and then the high risk woman would go on to more detailed uh, uh, investigation. Uh, so we're doing a whole number of studies, a longitudinal study, uh, People are interested now in uh, using uh, alterations in diet uh, to reduce risk uh, uh, levels. And so we're doing a study in analyzing girls uh, who are on a uh, whole fat diet uh, to see if that changes the pattern of optical signal and so it changes the risk. So that's the uh, uh, study that uh, sort of 
came from the combination of two different, two completely separate observations. Uh, second example I'll talk about is in, in, uh, in vivo optical diagnostics is fluorescence endoscopy. <coughs> uh, this is a project with a company in, in uh, Canada uh, called Zilix, who has developed a fluorescence endoscope system uh, based on measuring the fluorescence, the natural fluorescence of the tissue. And I'll talk more about this in detail this afternoon uh, to produce a false color image in which on the false color basically is displayed so that red color is abnormal and, and green is normal. So the two channel system, if this runs, uh, this is a video in the colon with that system. <coughs> and what you see here is a patient who has many polyps in the colon and this shows the fluorescence. You see, you see this reddish fluorescence on the green background. So all of these polyps are pre-malignant. If you look in the white light, you see the polyps, but you cannot tell whether they are benign and can be left or pre-malignant and have to be removed. And so it's used as a means of, of uh, uh, making it easier for the endoscopist to see the tumor to determine if the polyp is, is benign or pre-malignant and they will be able to be And I'll talk a little this afternoon or uh, perhaps tomorrow about why we think uh, these changes are happening. Uh, a lot of interest now in doing molecularly targeting of contrast that that delay system is with natural fluorescence of the tissue. Can you make this better by having a molecularly targeted contrast gain? So here is a, a project in which we're taking, for example, antibodies, but it could be peptides or aptamers, other molecular target, and you conjugate that with the fluorescent dye. Uh, and this antibody is specifically targeted, say, at the tumor. So here we have an animal model, this is human colon, uh, transplanted in the, in the mouse model, uh, so the mouse is given an injection of this. This is an antibody that's specific to this tumor, and it's labeled with a dye, Alexa uh, 647, and you see the tumor here, this is an image, this is a dial laser, illuminating the whole animal, and again, it has a filter, uh, and a CCD camera. Very simple setup, and you see the uh, tremendous mobilization. You also can tell that this animal was injected via the tail gun. It does not have a tail tumor. Uh, it was injected uh, via the tail vein and it's just got some uh, of the tail stuff here. Uh, what? OCT. Again, I'll talk in more detail about how this works. I just wanted to show one uh, collage. Uh, there's lots of groups working on OCT, which is an interferometric technique for subsurface imaging, uh, like, uh, which is uh, uh, very similar to ultrasound, but uses light, high frequency ultrasound. Uh, so many, many groups around the world are doing this. Our particular interest is actually to do Doppler OCT uh, to look at uh, vascularity and blood flow. Call, particularly in cancer and now with cancer. Uh, so we developed a system that I'll describe that this afternoon, uh, basically a clinical prototype, as you see, it's pretty big. Uh, so this has to be wheeled in. It's being used in the endoscopy unit. And here, looking down into the GI tract with the OCT probe. Uh, this is histopathology, and this is the sort of images you get, uh, either with, uh, I'm going to go the way here, uh, either with uh, the structural image, or in this case, the Doppler OCT, where the color coding here uh, tells you the blood flow velocity. I just want to show you one video, if it will run, uh, to give you an idea of the position of this. Uh, and this is sound as well, except I couldn't get my son to work. So, um, anyone care to guess what this is? Yeah. Who's very good at anatomy? Telling you, this is not human. Okay, I'll tell you, give you a clue. This is half a millimeter. Half a millimeter. 
camera inside a box. This is a commercial system. This box is claimed by the manufacturers to be the darkest place on Earth inside this box. Uh, because this is a single photon counting by all measurements. So you have an incredibly low background. Um, and this is an example uh, applied to PET. So in this case, we took brain tumor cells, transfected them with luciferase gene, and then those cells were implanted into the brain. This is the same animal each time, which is not sacrificed, but the same animal. Uh, we give an injection of luciferin, and you get the bioluminescence for about 20 minutes. And then it dies because this reaction uses up all the luciferin. Uh, and then two days later, we do it again, and you see the tumor is growing, the tumor is growing, and then we give PDT, and 24 hours later, you see there's a big drop in the, uh, uh, in the cells, but this is not a curative uh, uh, treatment, and it then continues to grow. And so in single animals, you can follow the growth response and regrowth of tumors. So it's a very uh, nice technique. Uh, and this shows that you can then get very good curves. This is the purple is the control animal and use the treated animal with the treatment and then the regrowth. So you can get a set of curves like this with maybe 10 animals or 15 animals. Whereas if you had to sacrifice five animals at every time point, Many, many, many more animals. Uh, quantum dot imaging. Uh, this is a, uh, a sketch of uh, this is size here, going from an angstrom to 100 microns. Typically, cells that are around 10 microns, bacteria is about a micron. Uh, fluorescent proteins are around 10 nanometers, and quantum dots uh, are also around 10 nanometers. Now, quantum dot is a little piece of semiconductor, uh, which has a very special property uh, in that uh, it fluoresces, but it fluoresces with very, very narrow emission, but with very broad excitation. So you can take a single source and make quantum dots of different sizes, because the size determines the emission, and you get all these beautiful colors. It's, so you have a broad excitation, narrow emission spectrum that is size dependent. So you just take the size of one to one. You do not photo bleach. If you shine light on them. Well, what kind of particle are those? These are semiconductor. Semiconductor. Yeah, so it's medium, uh, telluride, things like that. Uh, in fact, the, some of them even photo brighten. They get brighter when you shine light and you don't understand the physics of that. That's what's happening. Uh, and they have very high brightness. These are extremely bright. They're, they're called quantum dots because the size uh, means that when the photon is observed, there are actually only specific allowed states because this quantum, this particle is so small that it's governed by quantum mechanics. And so the size of the particle determines quantum mechanically what energy states are allowed. Uh, so these are very uh, fascinating, of particular interest to us because of the possibility to do spectral multiplexing. For example, you can take an antibody labeled to a red quantum dot, a second antibody to a yellow quantum dot, a third antibody to a green quantum dot, mix them all together, and give this to the animal. And then you can do multiplexed imaging where the different colors would report on the targeting of the different antibodies. And theoretically, we think that you could go up to about 20 targets simultaneously. Then, of course, you have to devise cameras that will allow you to do this sort of imaging and, and, and uh, a number of groups doing that. And yeah, the bowling of the antibodies to the nanoparticles, is that uh, well developed? No, so that's it. That, 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 the, this, the, the this shows an example from, from a group that you were in front of because the, the chemistry here is a huge challenge. And maybe 
because you basically are taking semiconductors and attaching organic molecules to them. Uh, and so that's a huge challenge. The other problem is that this is the things like cadmium in it, which is very toxic. So there's a concern about how would you cover these, these quantum dots so that when you give them to a patient, they do not fall apart and produce toxicity. So lots and lots of chemistry has to be done in this. Finally, I'm coming to the end. Uh, just let me show you a couple of examples in the area of lab on a chip and cell lab. So again, this is a collaboration with people in Alberta and uh, other places. Um, the uh, interest here is to do molecular analysis in single cells. So there's two ways, that, well, at least two ways that you can do that. One is so-called lab on a chip device which is what's shown here. So probably 100 groups around the world, maybe 500 groups around the world are working in this area. So the way that our lab has decided to do it is, uh, first of all, you make basically microelectrophoresis channel. So you take a piece of glass and you <coughs> take, a, take a femtosecond laser and you carve out channels in the glass, you can do it in plastic. <coughs> Using time to say the laser beam. Uh, this this uh, channel, as for example, you can make it long, uh, then has fluid within it. And so this has basically become a, a micro electrophoresis channel. Uh, what you want to do is then take a cell uh, and introduce it in the chamber here before it starts going into the channel and manipulate it. For example, take laser, open up the cell and attach some fluorescent dye to it and then put it into one of these channels. So you do the micro, the manipulation of the single cells using laser tweezers and you label it by chopping it open with laser scissors and do the mixing in the chamber, and then you allow that to flow into the channel, and you do basically, uh, I think I forgot to put it, you do basically electrical or, or optical sensing. Uh, so you have optical sensors along here, which give you the electrical signal. Uh, we only started this a couple of years ago, and uh, we're actually way behind. Uh, uh, there's some of the national labs in the States are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into this uh, uh, area. So we're kind of desperately trying to find what's a good particular niche for us to work in. The second is an uh, idea that is even more crazy. Uh, in this case, you take a cell and you bring it apart and analyze it. The cell lab uh, project, so-called cell lab project, which is a Canadian uh, the idea is to put the laboratory into the cell. They're going to actually move inside the cell with the whole laboratory. Um, and uh, in principle, that can be done, for example, using um, micro needle, microfibers. And one example of that is shown here. This was from a group in Ottawa. Uh, where they take an optical, uh, a uh, telecom optical fiber, and then, which is very, very thin, and then you pull it, and you make a very, very tapered tip. And then you take a femtosecond laser, and you make a little well at the end of the tip. This well is about a zeptometer. Many people know what zepto is. It's a guy in, in the crowd show, but uh, uh, the box brother is a central mark. But, uh, so it's 10 to the minus 21. So this volume is 10 to the minus 21, which is just a few molecules. So this is few molecule interactions. So you then need extremely sensitive optical techniques. So the idea would be, for example, that this would be put into the cell brought into contact, say, with a lysosome, and you would optically probe the biology on the molecular uh, 
chemistry of that lysosome in the single lysosome, minimally. Uh, so that's a, 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 I'd say, a Canadian-wide project. We have a small component only of that. We, we're doing some work on, on using uh, sodium sort of Raman spectroscopy as one of the projects. So I just wanted to finish by making a, 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 a general statement. Uh, What's happened in, at least in North America, uh, is that in the last two, three years, nanotechnology has become very, very important. Uh, the National Cancer Institute is putting 5% of its budget into nanotechnology, and the other institutes are falling. So uh, we think that nanotechnology is very important over the next decade, and that uh, photonics is very well positioned to bridge between the needs of biology and medicine and what nano, nanotechnology can do. Uh, so we are trying now very desperately uh, to uh, develop a program in nanobiophotonics so they can burn themselves life sciences, photonics, we already have that in biophotonics, but now you, you bring in nano into nanobiophotonics. So there's lots of arguments about that. We, sort of made the, made the decision that that's what we're going to do. Uh, this list here uh, to finish uh, some of the uh, projects that we're doing with industry, uh, just to indicate that there's a wide range of industry uh, and interactions and that we're very interested in uh, working with industry um, to, uh, to try to move some of these technologies into the clinic uh, or other so with that, I'll just thank you. Uh, this is the website, our website. If you want to have a look at it, uh, this is just a partial list of funding agents and collaborators. I wanted to uh, uh, just finish with saying that, um, as I indicated, I would say 95% of the projects in our lab are with collaborations with other institutions. So we really are very interested in working that way. Uh, we don't like just to work by ourselves. We get too bored with our own company. Okay, so we really like to do collaboration. So I'm looking forward to collaborating uh, with the group here very much. And uh, I hope that this will grow into a uh, very nice uh, long-term partnership. Thank you. is not 
really in the fabrication of the nanoparticles, it's not the biocontribution. It's in connecting those nanoparticles with the biological uh, targeting. Uh, and and that's needs, that needs very specialized chemistry expertise. So we do not have that in our lab. We, we are very lucky that the University of Toronto uh, has, that, has a guy who does that. So I think you, you, it would take you 10 years to, 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 to set up to do it yourself. And uh, commercial of it would say that it, there are a few companies yeah. that are providing these quantum dots. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, quantum dots are one of the most difficult. I mean, you can use metal nanoparticles. Uh, they are easier to obtain and easier to conjugate. Uh, uh, they have some applications, but a little more limited. Um, there are a number of groups making nano, nano uh, tubes, uh, which are really interesting. Uh, but I, I think the best way to do it is to is to uh, set up a collaboration with someone who does it. Again, I mean, there, there must be people here in Brazil who, who can do nanoparticle production. Well, nano tubes. Nano tubes. Yeah. <laughs> Nanotubes are really interesting. I, just, uh, the, I was telling you earlier that the group in the uh, US made nanotubes, uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, which is uh, sort of a lattice work. You look from the end. One atom thick. So these are tubes that are one one atom thick. Unbelievable. Uh, and because it's only one, these have the electrical properties, they have optical properties, they have mechanical properties. So what the group in uh, the, this group in, uh, uh, in the US has done is that uh, because these are only one atom thick, if you disturb the surface, you make a huge change to the physical properties. So they've shown that if you uh, if the cell comes and touches this nanotube, it changes the optical and electrical properties such that you could distinguish a normal cell from a tumor cell just by the way that it sits on the nanotube, which is amazing. Uh, so so they're, they're, they're planning to actually make a biosensor, uh, which is just in, in the, put under, uh, into the skin, and they claim that they will be able to detect single circulating tumor cells in the body. Uh, the reason that this works is if you look you look at the signal, let's say you look at the uh, conductivity of this, um, uh, if there is no cell, the signal is, is constant. As soon as the cell sits down here, this goes up by many orders of magnitude. So it's an unbelievable amplifier, a huge amplifier of the signal. Uh, and basically, can tell the difference between a normal cell and a tumor cell. So, I mean, just to, you know, you know, the thing is that the you can think about doing things that just were inconceivable uh, with, 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 without the nanotechnology. So, I mean, a lot of it is just going to be fun, uh, but some of it's going to going to stay that thing. So if you're an engineer, you can think about a nanoparticle as just an extremely high gain amplifier. It's a, bio, it's a biological signal amplifier, uh, either for detection or for treatment. I actually, I, 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 I kind of seriously think that for our own lab, we do not have a, in five
five years' time, if half of our money is not in nano biomechanics, we will disappear. I think we're just going to disappear. Because the, 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 uh, the science that you can do without nanoparticles or nanotechnology is just going to become obsolete. So I, think that I, I actually don't think it's a choice.